So fight or flight mechanisms are a working thing. They serve a purpose. The question is, why is it being triggered? So looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which we'll just go quickly over, well, we'll get there, really gets us to what, how are we surviving and why aren't we surviving? Anxiety, fear, worry, um, vexation, uh, ruminating, uh, hope, you know, we've all been there, right? Because we're all human. Why is it being triggered? Another way of describing fight or flight, and I don't know how many of you have heard or used this term, I'm in survival mode, right? That's another way of saying survival mode. So I kind of use them both interchangeably. Survival mode is encapsulating kind of all of the mechanisms in place. When we get into specifics, it's flat, freeze, fight, flight, fawn, face, right? All the F, Fs that they describe. Um, so what is survival mode? One of, something I want you to think about is what does it serve? This is very simple. What does survival mode serve? What is the point of survival mode? To survive. Yes, to survive. What, is that, what does that mean? I know it seems like pretty self-evident, right? To avoid death, to not die. Right, so it has everything to do with death. So I'm going into more specifics. It has everything to do with death. We're wired to not want to go there, right? Um, however, I think I said this before, human beings are the only species that intentionally commit suicide, right? So why is that? Um, survival mode, trying to survive. Trying to stay alive to avoid death. So think of it in terms of mortality. There has to be an inherent awareness of mortality, right? That you know what mortality is? There is an inevitable end to this experience. We are all mortal. You will die, period. I'm gonna die, my dog's gonna die, my children are gonna die, you're all gonna die, everybody's gonna die, right? However, while you're alive, we're wired to wanna stay alive. This is why we're here, it's evolutionary wise, why we're still here, because of these mechanisms in place. So evolutionary wise, when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and his theory on human motivation, this is where it's like, look, we're not all that complicated. Each of us are kind of wired. If you're here today, your ancestors had these mechanisms in place and it worked, right? So. I just wanna make sure you guys don't think you're special because you're not. Every one of us is wired the same fucking way. Every one of you here is wired exactly this way. If you weren't, you wouldn't have survived. Your ancestors wouldn't have survived. Some are the fittest, you were not fit enough. So these mechanisms are about being fit to stay alive against a threat to death. It has to, everything to do with death. So what is survival mode? A physiological adaptation in our body that occurs in response to perceived threat. These two words, super important. So there has to be some ability to assess our circumstance, our environment that we think is not good, that is threatening to death, right? So what Maslow found is this was predictable. Something that is getting inhibiting your access to food, water, Cleanliness, excretion, sleep will trigger this biological reaction. And the biology, biologic re, biological reaction is somewhat the same in all of us, right? It might be in different varying degrees, more cortisol, more epinephrine. There might be a little bit of difference in that, but in general, same response, right? So perceived threat, kind of a big deal. And this requires, well, this is what we experience as threat or stress, right? I'm stressed out. Well, something, situation, whether it's an assignment that's due, um, you're struggling to pay your rent, right? That has to do with one of those hierarchies of need. It's gonna fit in that model, right? So it becomes predictable. 
And it's actually kind of helpful to know if you're feeling a stress where it fits into that model to be able to go, okay, I'm really stressed about my basic resources. No wonder I'm feeling anxiety, fight or flight, right? Um, threat to one's access to food, water, shelter, sleep. This really brings us back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So it becomes predictable. So for example, if you're stressed about homework or an assignment, where does that fit in here? Anybody have any idea? Again, this is the original version, not the extra with the enlightenment side. Where would, I'm stressed about my finals or my midterms or this assignment or my grades, where does that fit into this model? Someone just spit it out. You can be wrong, it's okay. Anybody? Is safety and security. Safety, security. Esteem. Esteem, right? It can also be belonging, wanting to prove that you are worthy to someone else meeting a standard, but it can absolutely be esteem. So I would say those two, right? Feeling like you can handle something, that you're accomplished. So it might be a little ego-driven, right? Proving to yourself that you're intelligent or smart, not wanting to face reality. Maybe you're not the smartest. Maybe you're not as superior. Maybe you're just average. So it could be you're holding yourself to some superior level that's above kind of what's natural for you. Can you see how that's kind of like creating a, 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 a trigger? Especially if, for example, you want to get an A because you want to be a doctor. You need the grades. But what if it's too much for your whole picture? You don't have the time. You've got to work full time. You have other classes that are demanding your time. You might have a sick uh, animal at home or a boyfriend that's yelling at you. I don't know, right? What if it's not realistic? You've had a goal, but it's not realistic unless you go a little crazy, right? We've all been there a little crazy because you're overdoing it. So what's triggering it? Is it your life or is the standard you're holding yourself to really, really stretching you hard? So you gotta think about what the source is. Maybe it's not you, maybe it's not your reality, maybe the standards are not. You'd have to not have a job to get that A. You'd have to take away some of reality. Any of you relating to this in any way? Like, how do you manage this? My daughter, senior at MSU, biological engineer with a biomedical emphasis, Graduating in May, you have no idea how many times I've said, who gives a fuck if you don't get an A? Relax, chill. That's your problem. That's your problem, because she used to work full time. I, she's paying for school. Um, she's a tutor, she's in sorority, she's doing all the things, and she's upset. I'm like, let go of something, right? Or reduce your standard, because she's now in fight or flight because she's got these kind of extra special goals, right? Fight or flight should be reserved for real problems, right? Like real problems. And we, the goal is that you have the ability, that there is a developed ability to decipher a real issue from kind of like we are privileged issues, right? It's so awesome that she gets to be stressed out about not getting an A in some biological engineering class for extra special smart people, right? Why can't she just be a normal human? So by becoming a normal human and accepting your reality, you're less likely to have psychological problems that create physical biological problems that we learned about in our homework, right? So being able to identify where this trigger is at is super helpful because it helps you kind of pull back into reality a little bit and to give yourself the lenience that it takes to transcend into a different place, right? People who are self-actualized have the same circumstances, same shit, but they handle it in a more kind, self-compassionate and gracious way. doesn't mean they don't aspire to get an A or go to medical school or change the world, it just means that they're aware that reality 
it has to be done in their reality. So something has to give, right? So physiological needs, just a quick overview for anybody who wasn't here last time. Things we need to stay alive, period. Physiological. Safety environment, shelter, home, territory, healthcare, cleanliness, self-defense, tools, safety from elements. Again, belonging. Belonging is a third hierarchy. This is where most people have issues, right? Because we don't necessarily have a threat to our cleanliness to water here in Idaho. So a lot of a lot of issues with ego, when you hear ego, have to do with self-identity, who I am, and that's how you relate to your community. So a lot of things have to do with who I am, your own self-evaluation around your worth, and trying to fit in, right? So this is where a lot of this fight or flight in survival mode gets, uh, okay, so what does this require? This is important, so because a lot of times people don't know why am I feeling this way, why? They think it's the situation that they're experiencing. This class is, to, is super hard, it's stressing me out, right? Um, circumstances, are the source of my problems. That's, that's, a, that's a, the unconscious experience, right, of survival mode. It requires self-evaluation first. You don't just get stressed out. There is a, an evaluation of yourself first. So people who are, have lower esteem, who don't have a sense of their own autonomous, that means um, independent sense of worth um, from their own inherent skills and abilities, tend to, are, tend to be more sensitive to stressors. They don't think they can handle it. There is a sense of uh, threat, that feeling of threat the you know underlying like this would cause death even though that's not your immediate conscious thought is that this circumstance this situation i cannot handle it it's an assumption right and that's important an inner assessment of one's capacity is evaluated and compared to the situation so again this is important because if you have these issues you're able to say well of course if I don't get an A, the question is, can I handle that? If your answer is no, you don't have a sense of being able to handle it, boom, fight or flight trigger, right? Survival mode, that's, what, that's how it works. Self-awareness of your capacity compared to the circumstance, it is assumed you cannot handle it. That's the third one, assumption. I can look at a bear, like a grizzly bear, on its hind legs looking at me and make a fair assessment that I cannot handle that. I cannot, yeah, I will die. That is a threat. So either I fight the bear, so I'm still assessing, right? To fight, you're still assessing your capacity. To run, you're assessing a different capacity. Or you just paralyze yourself and hope that you disappear and he doesn't notice you, right? That's a different capacity, right? So there's all these hardwired mechanisms already there. We don't have to learn them. We don't have to install them. It naturally occurs, right? But it requires self-evaluation of your capacity, comparison to the situation, and the assumption you cannot handle it. So this is the cool thing. What if you were to make the assumption, you know, and again, an assumption you can't handle it might be because you think you can't, you, you think you're not capable. There is a thought or an, you know, a thinking, I'm too weak. I'm not strong enough. Well, what if you are? Because you've never done it before, right? So that's where courage comes in, and we'll talk about that at the end of the class. So sometimes people have that inner sense of weakness. They do the comparison. They know immediately I can't handle this, but they've got a tool, 
Like if I was in front of a bear, right? I do all that assessment, but I'm like, bear spray, right? That can give me a superficial sense of capacity. It can be helpful, right? So getting help oftentimes is the solution. And this can also be a crutch. This is where people can get in trouble, right? So it can initially be a good thing, but it can also have consequences, right? So imagine, my, I'm gonna use my bear spray, that because I have bear spray, I don't really learn my environment. So then I make the assumption bears are everywhere because I didn't really look at context. So I became attached to survival with bear spray. You know what we call that? Bear spray addiction. So when we hear the word addiction, it's important you understand it really comes down to whatever this is, I'm surviving with it. And I'm attaching to that survival. So that's kind of extreme, but it kind of maybe gives you a little bit easier to understand. If I don't think I can handle reality because I'm weak, but I have that, inner, I have a very low sense of self because I'm ashamed of who I am, because I make the assumptions I'm, I'm a weak piece of shit human being, everything I compare myself to is gonna feel overwhelming. I'm going to seek aid. And if I learn that carrying bear spray and learning about bear spray and making sure I constantly have bear spray and then I become a bear spray advocate and I'm on the bear spray committee, that I might have a mental illness, right? Because I am obsessed with how I compensate for being weak and small and tiny inside. So where's the issue? Is it the bear spray? Is it the bear spray that's the problem? Or is it the beginning, my self-evaluation? So in any rehabilitation program, well, most of them, or some of them, a lot of new research is the issue isn't, why are we fixating on what they're using to cope? The underlying issue is a broken sense of self, a sense of weakness, a sense of inability, because now everything is easy to trigger. Is it really the trigger that's the problem? Is it the bear, right? Maybe it's that inner sense of weakness. And this all biologically is impacting you, right? So very quickly, you don't need to memorize this, but unless you're going in this field, sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight nervous system. This is kind of cool and you need to know these symptoms. Um, one of the first things that, in fact, let me show you this book. So this book was published in 2002 or excuse me, 1902. Obviously, it looks a lot prettier than 1902. This is the original scientist, Walter B. Cannon, who coined the term fight or flight. This is his original book. You go and read anything about current fight or flight, this is, this is what they're referencing. Of course, now we have new science. We can go into deeper detail. But Walter Cannon is who studied this and created the foundation of human physiology, especially as it relates to fight, flight, fawn, freeze. And so at the time, they just called it fight or flight. The other scientist who was really huge in this was, um, Ma oh, not Maslow, oh my God, the ringing of the bell, what's his name? Pavlov. Thank you, Pavlov and his dogs. However, this is old. So we knew 100 years ago that if you're triggered into threat, Digestion stops. Your food isn't going to digest. So salivation goes down. Um, peristalsis, which is the natural smooth muscles that pushes food through your system, stops for hours. We, know, we knew in this book he talks about all the different emotions and how emotions affect this because they're not all equal. right? Feelings of boredom doesn't have the same issue as anger. Anger is one of the most triggering Everything stops when you're in anger because your body is primed to fight. It's putting all the energy into your cardiovascular and musculoskeletal system. So uh, your breathing dilates. So if you think about your experience with fight, flight, or survival mode, the heart, you can feel it. It is racing. You don't even have to be going yet. What it's doing is preparing. It's wanting to get ahead of the game so that if you need to, there's called this steady state. I don't know how many of you have learned about steady state yet in Kines. 
Okay, so your body takes about three minutes to get to a steady state doing any activity where the body's starting to be efficient and it's becoming very good at what it's doing. About three minutes in general to hit steady state. So as soon as you perceive a threat, your body's like, we got to get there. We need to get to that point. So it's kind of pre-thinking, fighting, fleeing, all those things, right? So immediately too, so inhibition of digestion dilates the bronchi, meaning it's starting to pull oxygen in. It's starting to get you to breathe harder. Your heart rate accelerates. That's getting oxygen to your muscles. It's taking all the blood away from your gut and into your uh, extremities and even away from the brain to some degree. And your, your eyesight. How many of you have experienced weird tunnel vision when you're in that feeling of full-on panic anxiety? It is really, really crazy. And the brain starts to misfire. Like, like you can't think about anything. It's going everywhere. It's racing, right? Um, unless you can pinpoint one thing and then you get obsessed, right? So the other thing really interesting is this conversion of glycogen, which, which is a stored source of fuel. It's a fast source of fuel that's stored in your liver and your muscles. It's, a, it's more readily available than fat because fat takes a little more time to break down for fuel. Fat metabolism is more for people in of relaxation, right? So if you're ready, getting ready to do something powerful or sprint, your body needs immediate glucose. So your blood sugar goes up. And when this book was published, they called it emotional diabetes. Because people in fight or flight have higher blood sugar without eating. They don't need to eat, so it looks like diabetes. Even though it's not, it's just a circumstantial increase of blood sugar to prepare your body to have the fuel it needs to run for glycolysis. So, which is glucose used for food or for fuel? It's kind of cool when you think about it. So when you think about how anxiety feels, all this is happening, right, during anxiety. Because anxiety is basically a state of fear and it's oftentimes a paralyzing fear. So yeah, your sympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic is like rest, digest, or chill. Think these are the people that are more have more self-esteem, people that have more competence, people that are more laid back. They're more on this side. They're not as, they're just way easier, easier going, more kind, more generous, they have more to give. That is a biological reaction to be on, let's say, Maslow's upper end. Biology allows them to be in that space, right? Biology turns this on. This is, you, but what does it require? Anybody remember? What does it require? What's the first thing it requires to hit this area? Self-assessment. Self-assessment. You have to believe you suck compared to whatever it is. I'm inadequate, period. Then, which is a comparison, right? Self-assessment, comparison. And then the assumption you suck. Bam, this turns on. Turns on. I can't handle that. I can't handle it. I don't want to face it. It's too much. It's overwhelming me. It's too much, right? And then your brain does all this. Your stomach starts to hurt. Any of you have childhood anxiety? Recall the pain in your stomach and you go, Mom, my stomach hurts. Or you go to the teacher and say, my stomach hurts. And they not know, but you were in stress. Anybody have that? Or recall that as a child? Yeah. It's kind of cool. So in short, this is kind of the biological, this is a small short. So insecurity, right? Stress is a sense of insecurity to handle certain situations. You don't have a sense of capacity. The adrenals are an organ on your kidneys. They basically send the signal to like increase your fight, flight, all the organs, hormones that stop digestion, right? Increase blood sugar, insulin, all the things, right? So this is a nice little picture. This is how it works. And notice too, it goes basically the end result of stress is for your body to be able to fight. Okay, so it's all about survival. 
So you can see here, tunnel vision, racing heart, increased breath, hair standing up, tight chest, stomach pain, loss of appetite, difficulty thinking, dread, impulse to do something. This is something else also. So it's not just a physical feeling, right? How many of you, um, and I know you don't have to raise your hand, but I want you to think about um, the feeling of terror. Like, it's sheer terror, right? I know you guys have had this feeling. Go, go even go to, like, childhood nightmares, right? Any of you guys have t night terrors or a terrible, horrible dream where you're left freaked out? Okay, that's terror, right? This response is happening in terror. It's kind of crazy. I think this is the coolest thing ever when you think about it. But having that terror response, how do you how do you regulate that? Anybody have an idea how that's regulated? You might not be able to do it in your sleep, but let's say you're alive and you're in terror. How can it be regulated? <clears throat> Some people work on breathing, yeah. So focus on one thing, breathing. Especially when you're disoriented, don't know why it's there, right? It's not clear to you why it's there. People think about deep breathing. It has a lot to do with your mind. It affects you cognitively. That was where I was headed. Terror affects you cognitively. This brings us back to our conversation that you guys had with each other is how the mind changes when you're perceiving um, a, a threat. Right? The mind is affected too. The way you think is affected. So research has shown, and we'll go into more detail in our next class about cognitive distortions. How our perception of reality changes when we have that low self-worth, low self-esteem belief that we are incapable, that we can't handle, that we're weak, we're insecure, that, that there is a constant cognitive compensation. Because what your brain is seeking is evidence of threat. So what happens to people who are in this state is they jump to conclusions about people. They wanna, they wanna predict when there's gonna be a threat. You wanna know it ahead of time. So you make assumptions, you jump to conclusions. You catastrophize certain things because your brain's going to the worst case scenario. How many of you have learned about cognitive distortions? This is great. We're gonna get there. So just so you know, there's not just a physical reaction, the brain is affected by these hormones. So someone in stress and anxiety tends to have a viewpoint very predictable because everybody in it has the same. It's the same, same, same. That's why they're predictable, jumping to conclusions, all or nothing thinking. I mean, they've got names for it. That people in depression and anxiety, you check the box on every single one of these. And these are mechanisms of survival. They don't make you a bad person. They don't make you um, worthless. But they do create a lot of strain in your relationships. They cause, a lot, they cause a lot of suffering. Because instead of thinking positively, you're thinking negatively. You're easy to manipulate because people can use fear to trigger to trigger your survival response, right? So survival mode is really something that we're not meant to be in for very long, and it's really supposed to be about the bear, right? It's about the bear, not do I get an A. So it changes our perceptions. Based on your sense of capacity to handle threat, again, it starts with number one, that inner ass assessment of worth, worth and capacity your body will go into a few different types of responses. So survival mode is based on fight, freeze, or running and hiding, negotiating or fawn, or to accept and surrender. So think of it in, in terms of the Fs. Freeze, fight, um, face, that would be surrender and accept. Uh, oh my God. Fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and face. So here is a, an example of that. 
So again, our body goes through the physical sensations of terror or fear. Heart rate goes up. Eyes dilate, all the things. And then that inner assessment says, what can I handle, right? So the fight response is probably the most positive in terms of um, you're feeling you can handle it. You, you're confident enough to think you can manipulate the situation, right? So that's kind of the high end of your response. Um, it also has a lot of downside because people who tend to have this um, confidence tend to be inflated. Inflation, think of it like in other animals, inflation is like the dog that has their shackles that come up. They try to open their mouth, make their teeth look bigger. Um, frogs like blow up. They're trying to make themselves bigger, right? Um, so it tends to be inflated. And it's this is not all the time right in here, right? Because you can be a nice person and still fight. You don't have to be an asshole. But generally speaking, people who tend to be fighters tend to be angry, tend to be inflated, tend to think they know it all, tend to think everybody else is doing things wrong. There's some generalization we can make with it. The freeze response, right? A different response. Flop, oh, I forgot about the flop. So we went through all this already. Flop is like, um, in terms of fighter or like a survival mode, it's a loss of capacity. It's a complete loss of your body's ability. So sometimes people pee their pants in stress. No joke. Um, fawn is how can I manipulate the situation by um, becoming pleasing to the threat? How can I please this threat? Again, this is more in human to human threat situation. All of this is mostly human to human stress, uh, right? So let's look at each one of these individually. Any questions about this? Do a little assessment. Which one is your common? Which one do you tend to go to? I know for me, I was way, way more into fun because um, I was raised in a very authoritarian upbringing. My dad had a lot of trauma from Vietnam. Um, and, you know, they teach authoritarian styles of rule in, in all the courses. So, you know, he became the ultimate authoritarian, used intense amounts of threat, uh, used to beat my siblings up. Literally, he had trauma, lots of problems. So Fawn was like trying to disappear, trying to please starting to clean the house right away, you know, doing everything you can to try to appease this asshole, right? So Fawn typically is opposite of this one. So let's look at the fight response. So it does require a positive assessment of one's ability, which is a great thing. That's a good thing, why not, right? It, it, for many people, it's a state of inflation, thinking you're bigger, stronger, better than you really are. So put yourself in a position of actually having to fight someone. If you're gonna fight, wouldn't you encourage yourself or someone else in that situation to pump them up? To be like, you're gonna do it. Why, why? it's a good thing. So these, are, these aren't judgments. So I wanna make sure you guys know that throughout this process, don't judge any of this. These are actual mechanisms that have been around for thousands and thousands of years, and they work under certain circumstances. Thinking you're bigger, better, stronger. Research shows playing music to hype you up, getting you know pumped up. Again, I would do it too if I knew I was gonna fight. Good for competition, good for war, right? So having kind of inflated sense of self, you're more likely to put yourself in danger Right? You're more likely to do what you need to do to survive. Can often be narcissistic. So I think we have a big lecture on what this is, but I'll be very brief. Because there's a lot of people make assumptions about what this, what, narcissi being a nar what narcissism is. And it's still being talked about and understood and still being um, 
studied, but we all have it. Every single one of you in here has narcissism. It's what, what do you think uh, fight or flight is? It's self-centered, self-preserving. -pres it's this viewpoint of self-preservation, and it's often attached to this idea that if you are special, it's a sense of wanting to be special. This is attached to the third hierarchy of need, belonging. Wanting to feel worthy through being special. Narcissism. Every single one of you went through it as a child. Every child thinks that if your parents fight, it must be you, it must be me. I think about everything is always about the child in the child's mind. It's how they survived, right? But it's supposed to have a, a kind of a, will you grow out of it phase. A lot of people don't grow out of it, right? Um, and it's not always a bad thing. Again, narcissism can promote hard work, the willingness to adapt, um, pride, uh, again, competition, wanting to be good at something, wanting to excel at something that has a lot to do with wanting to be special. Where it becomes toxic is when your sense of worth is attached to being better than someone else, being superior. So it's really important you know when it gets toxic is when this person literally thinks that they are superior to others, that they are a superior human being, that they hold themselves to these higher standards. Now we're getting toxic. Now you're getting inflated, right? Now you're living in perfectionism. Now you're expecting others to be perfectionistic, right? So it tends to thinking you're superior in, in terms of the fight response is a way to dominate or to put people below you. So this is where bullying comes in. Again, this is a response to want to feel that you have some worth in who you are and, and this person identifies in their mind that they need to be top dog to be valuable. They have to stand out. They have to be special. I need to be on a pedestal to survive, right? So yeah, that's how it can often manifest cognitively. It doesn't have to be someone punching you in the face or you punching someone in the face. It can be you trying to put them below you or thinking that you are better inherently as a human. That's a fight. And in general, to survive someone who has to be superior or in a fight mode, someone who has enough competence to fight will steal, will cheat, will lie. That's a form of fighting manipulated psychologically. Right? Because you have some level of competence to think that you're capable. So the flight response. Your confidence in your you're confident in the fact that you know you you can get away. So again, a lot of lying. So it's not black and white the transition between each. Escaping. And you're confident that you can cope. So there is a sense of capacity again with a with help. So if you go back to our like self-assessment comparison, assumption, help. The flight response is the help response, that I can do this with help, I can cope. This is not a bad thing, it just eventually has problems because you don't really develop a sense of ability by yourself. You, you end up developing a sense of ability with an aid, right? So the, that's kind of in some way flight. Forms of getting away, avoidance, denial, Oftentimes, like, um, the, the feeling comes up and you're, the impulse to hide from it, run from it, avoid it, that's flight. Um, distractions, being distracted. So a lot of times this flight response is linked to addictive behavior and addictive abuse of substance because you're escaping. You're fleeing, you're avoiding, you're trying to get away. Does that make sense? I've done this, I had an eating disorder. I was trying to avoid a whole lot of terror. And every time I ate, the terror would arise. And so I'd go run for an hour and the terror would go away. So I became really good at exercise. Oh my God, exercise is amazing. So I attached my gun, sp my bear spray was exercise. Obsessing over healthy eating. That was an escape mechanism because I had been traumatized, sexual assault, raised by an authoritarian parenting style, unaddressed PTSD from childhood. 
getting my hair pulled from a teacher. I mean, the list goes on, right? We all have these. But my way of surviving was trying to compensate, trying to make myself better through external factors. I wasn't making myself strong inside. I was becoming strongly attached to my coping mechanism so that I could hide and run away from the underlying belief that I was weak, incapable, piece of shit, unworthy of living. Anybody else have an experience like that? I mean, it became an obsessive compulsive disorder for me. It doesn't have to be that for you, but it can be as simple as, I just want to drink. I'm uncomfortable, let's get a buzz. I'm uncomfortable, let's smoke some pot. Because that'll, that'll give you some biological aid, but it doesn't necessarily fix why you're uncomfortable, why you're agitated. So can you see how that would be running away? Okay. Yeah, that's what I talked about right here. The freeze response. So this is like paralysis. Um, this can be experienced with like procrastination. How many of you are chronic procrastinators? Paralysis. Sometimes you're overwhelmed. There's a lot of reasons for this. It, it might not be that. It might be something else. But typical paralysis is the feeling. Uh, and you are kind of in a way wanting to like blend into the background. I always think of cartoons, right, where the person's like change colors, walk back into the trees, you know, they blend into the trees. You're just trying to not be seen. Shrinking yourself. Shrinking. Invisibility. You guys, anybody relating to these this, these feelings? Procrastination, that's common. For, and, but that can be for other reasons too. Detaching from your mind and body, disassociation. How many of you have heard of disassociation before? You're trying to avoid, that. it is an escape, right? But freezing in a way is trying to, again, hide, detach. Disassociation is detachment. Um, for in my case, I did not want to attach to my body. My body was a source of shame and disgust because I'd had sex before marriage. It was like the worst thing you can do. Again, that was my belief system that imposed that on me, but I believed it. So I get to have the shame. So I did not want to be attached to my body. So I man tried to manipulate my body to be safe. So I was attracted to these ideas of fitness and thinness and leanness and activity and fitness and competition and I was an athlete to to make my body safe so I was not inhabiting my real body I wasn't inhabiting it I was detached and not associating to it that's called dissociation anybody anybody want to talk about that I want to bring it up I mean it's just a, a sensitive topic so no no worries but I know for me even just recognizing that, I've been able to help others recognize it too because I could verbalize that's what that is, dissociation. You don't want to get in your body till you lose weight. You don't want to get in your body until you're big enough, strong enough. It's not safe enough. That's a freeze response. And we get into kind of these states of apathy, hopelessness. There's, it's pointless. Freeze response. Right? So it's not just one thing, and there's a spectrum if you think about it. It's like a sliding scale, and you can slide in and out of fight, freeze, fawn. You can kind of go back and forth depending on the inner evaluation against the external threat. Right? So it can change based on those things. And this happens without you probably even being aware you're going through it. Fawn response, you, want to, you won't survive alone, so you reject yourself to instead bond with who or what you think will. You abandon your own needs to serve others as a way to avoid conflict. So your survival becomes someone else. Your survival becomes your political views, your religious views. You become, you become that. This is brainwashing. Fawn response is rejecting your truth and reality to become something other than the truth. So you, you have to study. You have to know everything about this person. I used to do this with men. What music does he like? I'm going to like that music. I'm going to obsess over that music. I want to know everything about the music because I want this person to like me. So I'm going to be a chameleon. I'm going to change to what I think this person wants to be. I abandon myself to fond to someone else. 
And trust me, I attracted assholes for that reason. They liked that I was changing for them, agreeing with them. They, they wanted that. They were superior. They love to be worshipped. Are you kidding me? So that fawn response is usually a response to being raised in a narcissistic environment and having to adapt. So oftentimes, the fawn, someone who is a fawn responder is called a vulnerable narcissist because they take on the views of this grandiose narcissist in a compliance type of way. Have any of you heard about grandiose and vulnerable narcissism? Two very different things, but they still have the same ideologies and beliefs. So again, vulnerable narcissism is the fawning response to a superior individual you think will help you survive. Can you see why someone who doesn't believe in themselves would be attracted to opinionated, inflated, I'm always right, everybody's wrong type of politics, religion, authoritarian people, right? Why that would be attractive? Because they have all the answers, you guys. They know everything. They know who's bad. They know who's good. They're going to tell you all the rules. You, don't, you can just fawn and survive. Again, this is a really important survival mechanism. Um, this is, you could say, Stockholm Syndrome. Do you guys know what Stockholm Syndrome is? When someone is held hostage, the person being held hostage fawns to the person holding them hostage because they can survive if they do, do what they're told. They're going to get access to food and water if they do what they're told. So in a way, their survival attaches to that person and they fall in love. They develop feeling and affection for the person holding them hostage. People are this way in politics all the time. They are full on Stockholm Syndrome, even if it's horrible, even if it hurts themselves, right? Think of bodies of people who believe a certain belief, even though it literally hurts them because they fond to this narcissistic view and even though it hurts them. That's Stockholm Syndrome. And a lot of this has to do with fear of disapproval and criticism. So if you are not secure in yourself, you don't have a good sense of worth, you don't feel worthy, you're going to be super afraid of criticism and disapproval, right? Because it's validating your underlying beliefs. And it's a threat to abandonment, which is the third hierarchy of need. So that third hierarchy of need for belonging is now threatened. So people in Fawn tend to be codependent. Their, their survival is based on being needed and wanted and taking care of others. How many of you have been in a codependent relationship and no codependency? It's bad, right? It's toxic. Because there's usually the rescuer, and again, we'll go over this later, a rescuer position, someone who is the elite, who is the superior, who is the knowing, I'm going to rescue you, I know how to rescue. It can seem loving, but actually it's very controlling, right? And then there's the person who is weak and can't handle it and needs to be rescued, right? And they can flip-flop between those two roles. So that's what codependency is, and we'll go into that later in the semester. Again, narcissists love people who fawn because that means they have power over you and they can control you. And narcissists are not just people. They are belief systems. So I really would love for you guys to like open your mind to that thought. Does this belief believe we are superior to others? That others are inferior to us? Inflated. I'm right, they're wrong. What those beliefs might be. Have you guys ever seen the goat do this? The fainting goats? A flop response. Okay, so when my dog died, I fell to the floor. The floor. I literally sobbed and sobbed and could not move. It was hard to get up. It was like my body didn't want to function. It was bad. It felt terrible. That's a flop response. Grief, hardship, and loss. So usually in a flop response, <laughs> Loss of physical control, grief and loss. This is, where, this is like saying um, in, a, in a threat situation, I have failed, what's the point? Again, it's like the complete loss of, like if my, one of my children were to die, I, don't, I wouldn't be here, right? I would, be, I would be not moving my body. Why would you, 
Right, so that, that's not something to be judged. This is a real response. People who are in deep depression, right, where they don't, there's no point to getting up. There's no reason for life. Uh, what is the, there's no hope, there's no way out of this, are in a degree of flop. And they might need help to get out of it. They might need biological assistance, deep therapy. There could be a lot of things going on here, but this is probably the most like, mm, the low energy, the lowest energy of responses to a threat. Anybody have any questions about this response? Anybody else experience that? My mom died of cancer and it was terrible. She had brain cancer. She lived five years, which was amazing. I am so grateful for those five years. I think because it took so long for her to pass away, that I didn't actually experience this response the same way I did with my dog. I mean, it sounds terrible, but I grieved my mother's death when she had brain surgery and it changed her. I grieved it when we had to be there for five years. We would take turns to be with her to help her um, and she was there. We could talk to her. She recalled memories, but she didn't have her frontal cortex anymore, which is our processing area of the brain. So she used to be a master gardener, run a bed and breakfast. She would cook. She was an amazing cook. So she'd want to cook when I'd come visit. Robin, what do you want for breakfast? It was like the best thing ever when she was alive. But after her brain surgery, she, she couldn't process. She would have the desire She'd know what she'd want to cook, and then she wouldn't know the prop steps in between. So we had to go home and take care of her. But anyways, everybody responds differently to, you know, threat. Like my mother dying was a threat. This is the person that takes took care of me, that loved me, that was there for me, that, you know, raised me. And my response was not the same as with my dog. Isn't that interesting? I still think about that. Like, what was the difference? Face response. Ultimately, this is what we want. Because this is how you transcend survival mechanisms. This is how we as human beings can choose. When we learn to face and be open to the result, not knowing the end game, that changes everything. Your brain changes. Your sense of ability changes. It, start, it changes your base. This right here changes the foundation of your sense of capacity, which is the number one thing that triggers fight or flight. Face. Don't you love this picture? Facing it. So for me, to recover from an obsessive compulsive, suicidal depression, mental illness on so many levels, and never experience it again, what it took for me was to face my mortality face the, the religious beliefs that were holding me hostage that I had Stockholm Syndrome with, face the reality that what if I was a loser of a human being? So what? What if it's true that I suck? So I faced being a shitty person. If that's the truth inherently, innately, that means if I reject that forever, for the rest of my life, I'm gonna have to cope and compensate, proving otherwise. So by facing mortality, Facing the truth of who I am, facing rejection and abandonment by my parents and my family for leaving this religion, facing the fact that I was, was I a bad person because I had sex before marriage? I actually had to face the beliefs of that, which made me question my religion. I faced it, right? I also faced suicide and actual death too. So when you face your mortality, what happens to your fear of death? It diminishes. So if you have less fear of death, what happens to your sensitivity to fight or flight, fawn, freeze, right? Flop, all the things. You become less sensitive to survival mode. You can pick and choose when it happens. It becomes a choice rather than just an inherent trigger of unawareness, right? Because prior to me facing my death, I had no power. I was powerless to these mechanisms. They were running me. I would just have extreme anxiety and panic and terror 
every time I ate food. Just happened. It was like being washed down a raging river without any power. But the moment I faced it, I actually recognized where it became something that I could choose. Where the, what, what point was I needing to face? And by not doing the impulses, by not doing those things, it was like facing the Grim Reaper and doing nothing about it because I was open to the outcome. So the face response is the key to transcending those lower states of consciousness, those survival mechanisms, and getting into self-actualization, transcendence, right? Getting to a place where I am now free from my animal brain to some degree, right? I'm not free from that because I'm fine if someone doesn't like me. I don't care. It's more about, that's about them, not me, right? So this face response is what our goal is in this class, at least with this mental health topic, that you have the courage to stop making assumptions about yourself. Why don't you find out if you can handle it? Find out. So for me, I had to find out, can I handle gaining weight? Because I had an eating disorder. It's all about body image, not about food. It's everything about body image. I had to find out, what's the truth of my body? Am I willing to inhabit this body? If it's fat, if it's ugly, if people don't like it, if I break a leg, if I get in a car accident, become a paraplegic, am I willing to inhabit this body? Because if my answer is yes, whoo, I just transcended a lot of problems, right? If it's conscious and I like it, I'll take it. Right, so questioning your threats. Don't just go off of assumption on them anymore. So today, you're gonna have that opportunity. So I am gonna post homework. So those of you who have not finished homework, you need to do it. You need to get in there, unless you don't want the 100 points, because it's 100 points. And I will post a homework today. It's really simple, these are really easy. Just do them. This is how you get a good grade in the class. So, any questions? Awesome. We'll see you guys on Wednesday.